Hello, everyone. My name is Jacobo Castellanos, and I work with WITNESS, a human rights organization working globally with communities on the ground to help use video and technology to defend and protect human rights. I am part of the Technology Threats and Opportunities Program. And um, today, I want to talk to you about leveraging trust by tracking the provenance of digital media with open standards. And more specifically, to talk to you about our work within the C2PA. So that is the Coalition for Content, Provenance, and Authenticity, where technical specifications have been developed and are being developed to track, to, to trace the source and the history of digital media. So I'll start off with two videos that summarize, that'll do a much better job in summarizing uh, a lot of what I want to share with you today. They're both about a minute long. And I'll start with this one that gives a brief overview of what the C2PA is and how it works. The Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, C2PA, is a group of companies led by Adobe, Microsoft, Trupic, BBC, Intel, Sony, Arm, and Twitter that have come together to develop technical specifications for certifying the source and the history of media content. The C2PA has developed technical specifications that are meant to constitute a common agreement for provenance information to be created and processed throughout the life cycle of a digital asset, from the moment of its creation to the moment that it is published and consumed, crossing potentially through multiple tools or devices. The C2PA has launched version 1.0 of its specifications, which means that tools and technology can now be built to create this interoperable provenance and authenticity ecosystem. Okay, let me go to the second video that talks about how uh, this system could be used by uh, human rights defenders, civic and community journalists, and other communities that we center serve and support to fortify their truth. Provenance and authenticity infrastructure could help activists or journalists offer more credible image or video evidence of human rights violations. Imagine that a human rights defender captures footage of a war crime using a C2PA-enabled camera. The provenance information would offer verifiable signals to suggest that this is a raw, unedited video. Then, with a C2PA-enabled editing software, Sensitive information, such as the faces of individuals that appear in the video, may be blurred or redacted, leaving a trace of what was done to the media file and what was not. Finally, a C2PA-enabled publishing tool would allow viewers to trace the source and history of this asset in order to determine its authenticity. Okay, let me go back to work mode so you can see a talking head along with the slides. Um, so that was a quick summary of a, a broader complex system and I hope that it was fairly clear. I'm sure it raises more questions than answers. Uh, but I do have this next slide right here. I'm actually going to go uh, full screen again that summarizes the workflow. So we have this image right here along with its technical and non-technical metadata. So that is how we see images and we know images today. What the C2PA does is that it helps you create this verifiable contextual information from the point of its creation, right? So at this point, we have this box right here, which is called a manifest, that tells you what camera in this case was used to take this picture, what location, at what time, and it's signed by TruePic. The information in here could vary. And then as we go across the pipeline of this particular image, we see that at the second stage, it went into what it seems Adobe's Photoshop, where it was edited, colors were changed, it was timestamped and signed by Adobe, and then at the last stage, it seems that it was published by the New York Times, as we see here, but before that it was compressed and captions were added. So what the C2PA is doing is capturing this verifiable information across a workflow in order to give users uh, indicators of authenticity. Um, so what is at the heart of the C2PA is its trust model. What is trust based on in this case? And technically speaking, there's two things that the C2PA is doing. The first thing is that it's verifying the identity of the signer, right? So the signer in this case, in this example that we he see here, which is the active manifest, so the last manifest before you're actually consuming the image or video, 
we see that it's signed by the New York Times. It could be signed by any individual, organization, company. It could be self-signed by anyone or anything entity that has an X.509 certificate. And the process of signing could be automatic. You know, just by using an image, you could automatically have something signed, perhaps, or it could be more of a manual process. Um, and so what the C2PA does is uh, verify the identity of this signer. And the second thing that it does is that it verifies that the information that is being shared about an image or video, so in this case, that it was compressed and that captions were added, is in fact connected to this particular image or video that you're seeing, right? So um, two things that are being done, verifying the identity of the signer and verifying that the contextual information is tied to that image and video that you're seeing. Now, I, I mentioned that at the heart of the trust model is the signer, and there's two reasons for that. Uh, the first is because it is the signer that determines what information is attached to an image or a video, uh, what, what information goes into that manifest. Uh, if you may decide that you want to include a timestamp or that you may not want to include a timestamp or that you may want to include the camera manufacturer or not. The signer determines that information. But the second and more important reason as to why the signer is at the heart of this trust model is because what the C2PA is doing in its design is leveraging existing relationships of trust. So if you trusted, in this case, the New York Times before, then by verifying that this image or video that you're seeing indeed comes from the New York Times, then you may be more inclined to trust this image or video. Um, here I wanna offer just a brief parenthesis to talk about how Witness uh, came into this. Um, we've been working uh, with uh, communities on the ground that use video to protect and to, and to defend human rights and recognizing that uh, this uh, digital media could often be undermined or dismissed, that there's a need to fortify the truth and that provenance uh, information could be one of the mechanisms that is used in order to do this, right? So in 2019, um, uh, Witness published this report, Takes Where It Didn't Happen, that I'll share in the notes, that pinpoints to 14 key issues that need to be addressed uh, when thinking about or designing this provenance and authenticity ecosystem at this early stage rather than at a later stage um, of its development and its deployment. Uh, Witness has also been working with the Guardian project on its application proof mode that offers uh, visual evidence that can be verified. And the last thing that I'll say about Witness's role in this is that <clears throat> we've also been thinking about it from a synthetic media lens. So we recognize that more and more there's tools to generate um, uh, or manipulate images with AI and videos. And so there is a, a heightened need to, uh, to verify or to discern what is true from false, what is authentic from an authentic, what is real from what is fake. Uh, and especially and more so for communities that are marginalized and whose truth is often dismissed or undermined, as mentioned before. So uh, Witness uh, joined the C2PA, the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, with two objectives. Oops, and I'm going to jump to this slide right here. The first objective was to carry out a harms assessment, and that is what you're seeing here in this slide, and I'll talk about it in a second. The second thing that we've been doing in addition to this harms assessment, is trying to, well, having conversations with our partners on the ground, with the communities that we center serve and support, to identify uh, the, the designs, uh, the designs that need to be incorporated into these standards, into the tools, into the regulation ecosystem, so that it could actually be leveraged by human rights defenders, by activists, by civic and community journalists. And, and what needs to be included in all of these stages so that it could be used by them. Um, and that includes, for example, archiving. How could uh, archiving communities leverage uh, the C2PA, leverage these technologies to facilitate their process, to authenticate their media, to retain control of their media? Um, and I'll speak about that more in a second. Um, but the other part that I was mentioning is the harms assessment. So Witness has been leading the Threats and Harms Task Force of the C2PA. <laughs> and within this task force, we've led this harms modeling where we've adapted a, a harms modeling framework that is divided into these four categories that you see here. And we've been asking the following questions. How could the C2PA lead to a denial of consequential services? How could the C2PA lead to an infringement of human rights? 
how could it erode social and democratic structures, and how could it injure? And so in conversations with partners uh, and communities, we've identified a long list of types of harms and specific harms. And again, this will also be linked in case it's of interest or relevance to anyone. And for each one of these harms, we've uh, been trying to identify existing or potential mitigation strategies. So what could be done at the specs level, at the tooling level, at the regulation level, at the media literacy component level to uh, avert the possibility of these potential harms becoming actual harms. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here just for the sake of time. I do want to mention just one example. Um, we think one of the conclusions or one of the potential harms that we identified is that the C2PA could exacerbate existing inequalities. And one way, there could be various, but one way by which this could happen is by, if we connect it back to the trust model that I mentioned at the start, is by adding more credibility to images that come from uh, recognized outlets as opposed to those that come from perhaps communities on the ground who don't have that same level of recognition as the New York Times does, as, as in the example that I mentioned at the start. Because, as mentioned, the trust model is to leverage existing relationships of trust, right? And so for bigger outlets, bigger companies, organizations, or recognized individuals, being able to verify that something indeed comes from you may be enough for a lot of people to trust it. But when it's a news outlet that very few people know about, when it's an organization that very few people know about, when it's a, a witness, a bystander that uh, captures uh, evidence of a, a human rights violation, they may not have that same privilege. So there's a list of potential harms. Again, I'm not going to go into them. I'll just mention this last one just uh, uh, to offer one more example, we believe that another potential harm from the C2PA is that it could reduce options for anonymity and pseudonymity. Um, there could be various ways that this could happen. Uh, people may inad inadvertently disclose information. Uh, certain tools may simply not have the functionalities that are required to ensure privacy, to ensure anonymity, or they may have them, but they may probably, or they could just not have the right user experience that enables um, users to effectively retain control of their information. So the last thing that I want to say about this harms assessment is that we're looking at it from different angles. Uh, I think the call here for the archiving community is that we also need to look at it more deeply from an archiving perspective, both for harms but also for opportunities. Um, and as I'll mention later, that uh, we're, this is a conversation that we're happy to have and that we hope to have in this space, but also stemming from uh, this conversation. Um, by way of conclusion, I wanted to somehow connect it uh, more specifically to archiving. Um, and so I think there's two things to say about the C2PA. First is that it brings a new trust model to the authentication ecosystem. Uh, and along with this trust model, a, a, specific, a specific technical design, technical specifications. And this trust model, along with its technical specifications, comes with pros and cons for the archiving community. So uh, one uh, pro, for example, is that it could, in one way, facilitate the process of authentication. In others, it could make it more difficult. But there's still a lot of open questions. What are, how could uh, the design be better suited to uh, enable uh, communities to archive? Um, how could we prevent harms from uh, the C2PA model in archiving, right? So that is one part. The second part is the fact that, well, we've got to recognize that uh, Providence tools don't stem from this. There are tools that have been used before. So there's the example of SAVE that uses the Guardian Project's uh, uh, proof mode code to authenticate images that are being preserved. But the one thing that the C2PA, along with other efforts, such as the, the Content Authenticity Initiative or Project Origin, what they are doing is pushing us away from niche tools and niche usage towards more widespread, towards more systemic use of provenance and authenticity. And that has implications for the archiving community. So on the one hand, for example, by creating this ecosystem that we may be facilitating that more tools, more services, more hardware, more, more software, includes this system of capturing provenance information, thereby enabling um, a chain of custody of sorts that could facilitate the work of, of archivists to authenticate content, perhaps, 
but also recognize that by creating an ecosystem, we may also be raising the stakes of authentication. We may be requiring, adding more, uh, a higher need to include provenance information. And that is problematic because we recognize that there are legitimate reasons not to want to or not to be able to use these systems. So for example, they may, be, they may come at a financial cost. There may be technical barriers that don't allow many people to use these systems. Or it could be misused by governments or corporations to surveil or to put checks on, on, on freedom of expression. And so in these scenarios, pe people may not be able to use them or not, may not want to use them for legitimate reasons. And yet we may be creating an ecosystem that is adding the need to include provenance information and, and thereby undermining archived content that does not include it. So there are a lot of open questions. I think what I want to uh, leave you all with as a way of, uh, yeah, just to end this uh, presentation is to say that we're hoping to open up this conversation to think about more specific one key question that we have is how could communities uh, use these systems to uh, retain control of their archives? What, could, what, needs, what are the red flags that we need to look out for? What are the designs that we need to think about? What are the tools that we need to think about? And um, I'm hoping that uh, part of this presentation at least opens up that uh, discussion within this uh, space and beyond. Thank you very much and goodbye. Wonderful, thank you very much, Hakaba. <laughs> Let me see if I can bring you back to full screen. I may need help. So I wonder if we have any questions immediately in the room, Hakaba? Yep. You can stop sharing, right? You can stop sharing. So we had a few little um, issues at the beginning there with your um, presentation technically, so we're going to give you a couple of extra minutes. Um, so I guess I wonder if a question from myself, if, if we wait for some in the room. Um, I wonder if five years from now, um, if the provenance and authenticity ecosystem becomes mainstream, what kind of um, scenarios can archivists expect to encounter, do you think? Hey, everyone. Uh, <laughs> So thanks for bearing with that presentation, pre-recorded presentation. Um, so thanks for that question. Um, I think that a, a good scenario five years from now will be one where uh, verifiable provenance information is just one of the many elements that strengthen archiving as a practice and as a community. Um, I think that one of the great things about media is not just that it tells a story, but that the media itself is part of the story. Um, in fact, uh, the source and the history of media can be the story in and of itself. So where a picture was taken, uh, by whom, uh, what camera was used, or if it was edited and how. I think that uh, for a long time, uh, metadata has been sort of an afterthought. Um, it's something that not many people know about, and those that do, just it's not considered often. Uh, but if providence and authenticity does become more mainstream, I think it'll be just as important that more and more people know about it and understand uh, metadata. And that uh, not just for reasons of privacy and safety, but also uh, to see metadata beyond that as part of the tools in our toolbox to tell a better and more complete story. Um, so, so that is the first part of, of the answer. A good scenario is one where provenance and authenticity helps us capture a more complete story of a person, of an event, of, of the video or the image itself. Um, and the second part of, of the answer is that a good scenario is one where uh, provenance and authenticity tools such as this, the C2PA, help us make better decisions about how we interpret the media that we're consuming. Um, and more generally, how it helps us create a more trustworthy uh, digital environment, or how, as witness has been uh, pushing for, how we fortify the truth. Um, so I think to sum up, uh, provenance and authenticity tools in the future uh, to, to be something that's positive, I think it shouldn't shake up the archiving community to the point that it's something that is required, 
but it's just one of the many tool uh, one of the many tools that we have at our disposal to tell a better a more complete a more trustworthy story um, for users now or in the future that's wonderful um it sounds like um i mean i'm in awe of what witness do and this is just an amazing project um and i love the reflexivity your your the process you're going through as well of being reflexive about the pros and cons of the of the the new system that you may hopefully bring in successfully um i wonder how we might be able to continue the conversation for you how might people be able to help you continue this discourse and develop something more yeah so i think for this the same applies i think for many technologies that are coming into the world is uh, how do we get involved? What are the spaces that we need to get involved in? Uh, what are the conversations that we should be having and who should be part of these conversations? So I think Witness now, part of our work has been focused in, in the standard space. Uh, so uh, I, I think a good way to uh, come into this uh, conversation is to how to think about how we could shape the standard space, right? And, and there's also a big question about who should be part of that. Uh, just because in standards in general, uh, I think at least it, it's been my experience, but I think it's, 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 it's part of a broader reality that they're usually very close knit uh, spaces where there's not a lot of room for everybody to be part of. Where there's usually a very small uh, group of, of, it's not a very diverse space, right? So I think that one way to participate is just to bring more people into these spaces. Uh, and, and that is what Witness is, is, is doing within the C2PA. How do we uh, get more people, if not directly, at least indirectly involved uh, in the process of, of creating these standards? Uh, but that also applies to the tooling stage, how uh, as tools are developed, how more people are part of their design and how more people are part of their deployment. Um, and so just to give a more concrete answer as to how more people could be part of this process, I think one way could just be, you know, reaching out either to us or to the C2PA uh, or joining the processes more directly. And um, I, I did leave my contact information there and hopefully that could be shared along with this presentation. And, and uh, if this does seem of interest to anyone or, or if, does, if this does overlap with your work, I think that the more people that we could uh, bring into this conversation, the better. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the time you've given us today to come and present. So thank you ever so much. Thank you.